just hasn't been part of my uh, routine, but grateful to the opportunity to to be of service. Um, a couple of quick uh, things for me, my sobriety date is May 10th, 2012. Um, I am uh, from Omaha, Nebraska. If you're ever in Omaha, love to uh, welcome you to my home group. It's the Young Soper and Free Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet Friday nights at 7 p.m. in Omaha. So if you're ever in Omaha and looking for an in-person meeting, we'd love to we'd love to have you. Um, and I also have a sponsor. Um, you know, I say these things because uh, when I got to you all, um, you know, people describe themselves as sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they always talk about a sobriety date, a sponsor, and a home group. Um, you know, and when I got here, I didn't want any of those things. And today, I'm internally grateful, you know, that I have those things. It took me, you know, a few years in and out to get a sobriety date. Um, it, it took me some time to uh, find a sponsor, and it took me probably even longer to get to a group consistently and be willing to be vulnerable in that way. So grateful for for my home group as well. Um, you know, tonight, my job is to share in a, a brief general way what it was like, what happened and, and what it's like now, and hopefully kick off a, a topic for um, the meeting um, to those really quick that that were celebrating anniversaries, or if anybody was new, um, and, and did mention that you're new, welcome. Um, you know, when when I was new, somebody told me, you know, in that moment of silence, that's uh, we've been waiting for you. And that moment has been for you. I'm grateful that you're here. Um, you know, I'm going to share in a general way um, tonight. And there's enough differences in all of our stories, you know, for us all to not be able to identify. But what I was taught was to listen for the similarities. And if you're listening for the similarities, I can hear a message that that might, you know, save my life. And so I'm grateful that, that you are here as well. Um, in a in a really general way, um, you know, I I grew up in a pretty privileged environment, had everything I needed or wanted, um, and lived in a world where you know, as long as it looked good on the outside, it didn't really matter uh, what was happening on the inside. Um, some really horrible things happened to me as a as a child, um, you know, and and those things aren't the reason why you know I took my first drink, um, but they certainly give give explanation for what was going on you know, if inside my ears and why, why I uh, was attracted to a drink. Uh, for me, I saw, you know, people in movies and TV shows and my parents even who aren't alcoholics. I saw them take a drink and then they would have that exhale that like, and I wanted that in my mind, that was what I needed. I needed that pause. I needed to be able to catch up with you all. Um, and I, I thought if I could do that, I would be okay. And the pain and the trauma and the health issues and all the things I'd experienced would be okay if I could just get that pause. Um, so for me, at the age of 11, I, I took my first drink, um, you know, and I had that pause. It, it was nothing that terribly exciting, nothing that glorious, um, but I, I felt that. Um, and, and alcohol then, you know, did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Um, and, and I understood, you know, the effect that alcohol, you know, produced for me. And I continued to seek that. Um, when I was thinking about a topic for tonight, you know, I was reflecting on like the grapevine daily quote. I don't know if any of you subscribe to that, but the AA grapevine or meeting in print sends out a, a daily quote every morning available also in the, the new app that they just launched. Um, and the quote is from a, an issue from the late nineties and it's the number one way to relieve pain is to forgive. And, you know, for me, forgiveness was not a word that was in my vocabulary. Um, you know, I'd had a lot of pain as a kid, a lot of really horrible things happened. Um, but for me, a, a drink solved that problem. Um, you know, it didn't matter what was going on around me as long as I could, could get a drink. Um, and pretty quickly that turned into a, you know, an all day, every day, you know, thing. I was a, a daily drinker in middle school. I thought that a drink would solve your problem too. I didn't understand why people didn't drink like I did. Um, you know, I ran for student council president on the platform of if you want your life to be better, drink like I do, because I, I really believed it was going to solve all my problems. Um, you know, I, I talk about it as alcohol was my best friend together. We were going to conquer the world. Um, and that's how I drank. I drank as if, you know, it was my lifeline to being OK. Um, the challenge and, and I'm sure you all can relate to this at some point that's not working. Um, people started to get opinions about my drinking, as I like to call it, um, you know, and, and my drinking and my actions were causing them pain, um, you know, and, and I I didn't seem to care. 
um, if you got in the way of my drinking or I perceived that you were getting in the way of my drinking, I surgically removed you from my life. And if I couldn't do that because I was a child, um, I tried to make it as painful as possible so you would eventually leave um, because I needed to take that drink. I needed to be okay. I needed that exhale. I needed to catch up. The challenge, you know, is is that that catch up never really happened. There was never enough alcohol that I could consume in a day uh, to be okay with what was going on around me. The good, the bad, the different. Um, one of the, my first sponsors, now called Anonymous, you know, asked me to like, as part of my first step, to make a list of all the reasons I thought it would be okay to take a drink. And, you know, that list started off, I still have it today. It's actually hanging in my house as a reminder. Um, but it started off as, you know, big, horrible things and great celebrations. And, and it, it literally ended up in a place where, you know, if if the clouds were a different, you know, pattern that day, or the sky wasn't quite blue enough, like, you know, because what I learned is it doesn't matter what's happening around me. Um, you know, it has nothing to do with that external reality. Um, you know, and I found my way to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was 15 going on 16. Again, people had opinions about my drinking and, and I thought that this would, you know, get them, you know, off my back. Um, I was a daily drinker at that point. I don't know, probably drinking maybe a half a gallon of vodka a day or so. Um, you know, and I thought life was just fine. Um, you know, and I'd come to a meeting here and I'd come to a meeting there, you know, and I'd sit in the back and say things like, I'm so glad that Alcoholics Anonymous is here for all of you because you all clearly need this. I'm doing just great. Y'all just need to leave me alone and we're going to, we're going to figure this out. Um, you know, and that, that never really happened. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a drunk that will drink regardless of what's happening. I had some pretty significant liver health issues going on. And I stared at that doctor straight in the face and said, if you would just do your job and fix my health issues, my drinking would be none of your business. Um, and I say that because that's a reminder of what happens to me when I take a drink. I get to this place where I think it's a good idea to drink myself to death, even though my liver is failing. Um, you know, nothing, you know, is, is going to get in the way of, of me taking a drink and, and being okay. Um, and, and that's how I lived for a few years. I was in and out of AA. I'd get a few days here. I wouldn't there. I'd kind of show up to a meeting. I, you know, would be, you know, a, a ridiculous, you know, creature of a human being, um, you know, but people in Alcoholics Anonymous always welcomed me back. They, they never treated me any different. They were glad when they saw me. They treated me with dignity and respect. They grabbed me a cup of coffee and said, we're glad you're here. They also said, you know, keep coming back and that they pray for me in my desperation. Um, you know, and, and that went on for a few years. My last drink is nothing terribly exciting. Um, I was working because you all told me I had to have a job. Um, I graduated school and you know, I was out to dinner with some clients and it, one thing turned into another and I was convinced I had to drink. I had done what you all had taught me. I got a soda from the bar, but I was convinced they'd wonder why it wasn't liquor, you know, and then I was convinced once I decided to get, you know, booze, you know, that they'd wonder why I wasn't drinking. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'll just drink this one and then they'll get off my back. Mind you, nobody cared what I was doing. Nobody said a single thing about what I was doing. Um, but that obsession um, was there and and you know for whatever reason I wasn't okay in that moment and a drink became very appealing you know not much different than pouring whiskey and milk like it talks about in the big book um, you know and I, I took that drink and I knew instantly in that moment that I was going to keep drinking and I needed these people to leave because I knew they couldn't see me drink like the way that I needed to to be okay um, and I, I got them to leave and I, you know, went to the bathroom in this bar, was washing my hands and, you know, could see my, you know, self in, in the mirror. And, and in that moment, I could see myself or who and what I was. I knew that I was going to keep drinking that night and I had no clue what was going to happen to me. And I didn't care if that meant I wasn't going to, you know, make it the next day. Okay. If that was going to be my, you know, childish dream if I was just going to have a couple and be okay was going to happen. Okay. It didn't matter to me, but I knew that I was going to keep drinking and there really wasn't much that anybody or anything could do about that. And for me, while that's not that dramatic of a, you know, last drink, it's significant for me because finally, you know, both sides of our first step, you know, came into my consciousness at the same time. There were many times previously when I knew my life was unmanageable and there were many, many times when I was, you know, convinced I had no power over alcohol. But in that moment, both of those, you know, sides of the first step came together and I was able to see that 
and I was able to accept that. Um, and you know, that, that was something new for me. Um, you know, I don't know exactly how much I drank that night, not a, you know, not a lot of memory of, of what happened. Um, but I, I came back to Omaha the next day I was out of town, um, and, and met up with my, you know, sponsor at the time. And he had asked me how drinking was the night before. And I was instantly annoyed because I'm like, are, were you following me? What's happening? I was paranoid. Um, you know, and, and I learned that it, it's really hard to BS a BSer. Um, he knew, you know, when I was sober, even though I was saying I was sober and he knew when I was doing this, that, and the other, um, cause he had, he had walked through my experience and, you know, I, I learned again in that moment, another example of an Alcoholics Anonymous, people always treat me with humanity. You know, they didn't treat me like people around me did like the unlovable human being that I was and how I acted. Um, they didn't, you know, stop, you know, just because, you know, I was causing them pain in every moment to be around me. They continue to share their experience, strength, and hope with me in hopes that one day I might find the gift of desperation, you know, to, to take these steps and, and to, to live a different life. And so, you know, from there, I, you know, I, I reworked through the steps. My sponsor would probably say I worked through them for the first time in, in, in that moment, you know, and, and started that process. Um, but this whole idea of relieving pain was something that I, I had to come to grips with. Um, you know, the, the initial reasons why I thought it was a good idea to take a drink were still bouncing around in, in between my ears, just because I had, you know, come to this realization and had that step one experience didn't make that vanish. Um, and I wasn't at the, you know, the fourth step yet. I had some work to do, but, you know, my sponsor knew I was in a lot of pain and needed to do something about that. And he suggested that I pray the resentment prayer that's in, you know, chapter five of the, of the big book. Um, and to do it, you know, twice a day and to say it in a mirror and to record myself doing it. Um, and he didn't care how I said the prayer. He didn't care if I screamed it. As long as I said, you know, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. You know, they will be done. That's what he asked me to do. And I was so willing um, to to be okay and not have to take a drink again that I was like, this seems ridiculous, but I'll try it. Um, you know, and I tried it every, he told me every day, twice a day for two weeks. Um, and so I did that and, you know, I don't remember if exactly at two weeks, it was a little while longer if I remember right. But the crazy thing is, is, is it started to work and those things from the past didn't haunt me as much. Um, you know, I'm a person that like the big book talks about needed some outside help for some outside issues related to those things. And so, you know, I was also encouraged to, to seek outside help if I needed it. And that was a, a part of that solution too. But for me, you know, when I was in and out of AA, I said, if you guys can deal with this issue and help me with this, maybe I'll believe in your solution. Um, and, and that's what AA did for me, you know, through sharing that experience of, saying this resentment prayer to something that I didn't believe in for a person that I didn't really want to be helpful to. Um, but I learned that, that my, my beliefs about it didn't matter. It's that I take the action and eventually my mind catches up to that. Um, and I, I worked through the steps. Um, you know, I, I got to work a fourth step. My first fourth step when I was like 16 was on one side of a three by five index card. Um, so, you know, apparently I didn't have much to write down, but I learned what a, a searching and fearless moral inventory looks like and getting to really understand not just taking people, you know, to, to court and being judged during executioner in those first couple columns, but really understanding what my part in this and how I'm perpetuating this pain. Um, or in some cases where I didn't have any, any uh, part at all, except not forgiving the person. Um, you know, and, and I was able to, to really see my part in, in these things, um, you know, and through step six and seven, I was able to get to, to some freedom. Um, and that's the craziest thing. Um, Tom, I, uh, the a speaker, um, he's no longer with us, but, you know, he has a talk on six and seven. It's on YouTube. If, if you haven't heard it, where he talks about that, of how through working step six and seven, I get this freedom. And I can go anywhere and I can do anything and I can see anybody and be okay. And to me, that's what, you know, that's the gift that I was given. Um, you know, I was able to, you know, uh, sit with myself and my thoughts and not, A, just have to take a drink, but not have to be an asshole, not have to surgically remove people from my life because they had opinions about me or what I was doing. Um, and in eight, nine, ultimately, you know, where those nine step promises we read earlier started to come true for me. 
when I started to make those things right. Um, you know, and, and I got to see how I was able to make right the pain that I had caused in other people. And in doing so, so much of that pain, you know, that I experienced, you know, was was taken from me. Um, you know, and, and going through the steps the first time, you know, was was significant for me. I, I'd never done anything that anybody asked me to do for that long of amount of time ever. Um, but at some point in the middle of that process, it dawned on me that I hadn't thought about taking a drink in a really long time. You know, and I'm the drunk that wakes up in the morning and, you know, reaches for, you know, the bottle of vodka that's hopefully in my bed somewhere, you know, before opening my eyes. And if I don't find it, I go stark white and I, you know, have sheer terror come over me as to where it is. So for me, you know, realizing that I hadn't thought about drinking was a really big deal, um, you know, and, and through, you know, working the steps, you know, I haven't had to take a drink, you know, for 11 plus years. I don't really understand the people that say they haven't found it necessary to take a drink. I found it necessary many of times. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous, though, has just given me a solution, um, you know, in a different way of, of living where there's a different solution that not only is more effective in my experience, um, but doesn't cause all of the pain, suffering, humiliation, you know, all the things. Um, you know, and, and so that was my experience first working the steps. I've, I've done it a, a few more times since then with some different sponsors over the years, but that continues to be my solution today, you know, to relieve pain is to, to forgive, you know, it is still, you know, what, what you all teach me to do. And, and today I, I honestly don't have a lot of pain in my life, you know, thanks to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I get to live a life today where I have these beautiful relationships with other humans. I have a job that wants me to keep coming back to it. You know, um, I get to participate in, in, you know, this crazy fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, when I got sober, people would send me an invitation with a different place and a different time and a different date on it because they knew they had to invite me, but they were terrified that I would show up with all my drunken craziness. Um, and today I get asked to be of service, which makes no sense to me how that's possible. But by taking these steps, by you know, working on forgiveness by working through the pain that, that gets me here. Um, I'm able to to do that one one day at a time. And and life is beautiful. You know, I was just at, at Ikipa, you know, last, well, I guess weekend before last in San Francisco, and, you know, saw some great friends and, and met a whole bunch of new ones. And, you know, these are the experiences that I get to have today, you know, when when my whole life isn't, you know, wrapped up in in the next drink and how I can escape from the reality that I'm in. But, you know, through through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm able to work through those things one at a time, um, continue to ask for help, you know, like I was asked to, you know, when I first got here, um, I continue to ask for help. I continue to take these actions. Um, and it, it's a, a beautiful life that I get to live. It doesn't always mean life is easy. You know, since being sober, I've had a couple of brain surgeries. I've had a couple of cancer scares. I've had, you know, all sorts of, of life happen. Um, but the, the beautiful thing is, is I've been able to stay sober through that. And, and that's a, a gift of which I'm eternally grateful. I'm grateful again to be able to participate in your meeting tonight. And with that, I will take another 24 and pass.